Great, thanks, Glenn. Um, so I'm going to, um, as Glenn said, our title is long, um, but we're going to talk a little bit today, Mark Baggett and I from the University of Tennessee, we're going to talk about um, how we've decided to utilize the Presentation V3 API um, to deliver an oral history project um, that is called Rising from the Ashes. So the goal of the project itself is to document um, the Chimney Tops 2 fires, which really ravaged the Gatlinburg and East Tennessee area um, several years ago. Um, you may have remembered um, hearing about it on the news. Um, it was uh, quite an event in this area and affected um, many people. Many people lost their homes and their livelihood. Um, we have conducted uh, about the project so far to date has about 141 interviews that have been conducted, four of them um, in Spanish language. Um, there will likely be up to 10 of those. Um, we have 46 contributed by the Anna Porter Public Library in Gatlinburg, who is a partner on this project. And all the others have been captured by the University of Tennessee libraries. Um, and people who, who work uh, with the libraries. Um, the interviews themselves um, are a mix of in-person video capture, audio only, um, some Zoom capture, and, and a couple of Facebook live captures. Um, obviously, there were a number of challenges during COVID um, for conducting oral histories in person. We started conducting oral histories in person using uh, video um, and we conducted a, a large amount of those and then COVID hit and we had to rethink how we were going to do video capture. And so what we did was actually turn to Zoom and um, capture videos via Zoom. And then um, based on comfortability level, some people weren't comfortable with Zoom. So that's where the Facebook live capture came in with a couple of, um, of people who were, were more familiar with that format. So we've tried to be flexible as far as capture goes um, so that we could get as many videos as possible um, as a part of this project and, and get as many stories. Um, from the community and different points of view as possible. Um, the project is very representative of different experiences, occupations, backgrounds, um, from firefighter and police to um, people who worked at uh, Aramont, which is focused on arts. So there's many, um, many different occupations um, represented um, and experiences, people who lost their homes, people who worked in restaurants, things like that. Um, so we collected uh, quite a bit of data. Some of you may know Casey Kaufman, who works at WGBH. Um, she's actually been working with us on this project part time and um, has brought her expertise to bear here and uh, really helped us um, with not only conducting a number of the interviews, but also um, guiding us in some metadata capture. Um, I think uh, what's some of the things that are interesting about some of the metadata we've captured, um, including rights, is that um, of the UT conducted interviews, um, we've had people sign an agreement um, in almost all cases that agrees to a CC BY license. Um, only a few people have asked for an exception to that. Um, the Anna Porter Public Library uh, that were conducted audio interviews, uh, slightly different case because they were previously, they were done outside of the scope of this project. So the rights on those vary. Um, so other data that we've collected besides this rights information includes um, data about geographic locations of the interviews, significant places that people talk about in the interviews, data about the interviewees themselves, including where they were born, the length of time that they've lived in East Tennessee, occupation, and there's lots of other data that has been collected. Um, we have also generated captions using uh, WebVTT, 
And we used Canvas Open Studio as a tool to generate those and then correct those um, for captions as well as transcripts. Um, we are making available full corrected transcriptions as well as translations for the Spanish language interviews. So why did we decide to use IIIF, you may ask? Um, so we have this concept of IIIF as trunk. Um, it's something that we have been talking about here um, for over a year that we want IIIF as kind of at the center of our stack for delivery. Um, Mark Monienzo and Esme Cowles kind of uh, coined this in a presentation, I believe it was uh, earlier this year at CNI, and they talked about this concept of IIIF as trunk, and we really, um, we really took to that because that's really what we had been talking about internally, where we wanted to go, um, thinking as we re-envisioned our stack, thinking about how IIIF was key for digital content delivery for us, including um, pushing out to digital collections, exhibitions, our institutional repositories, and other front ends. So right now we're in the midst of moving, um, we're in the midst of an RFP process where we are um, moving from our current platform, which is an Islandora 7 Fedora 3.8, um, developed, hosted locally, customized locally. Our next system um, is going to be a Hyrax or Haiku-based system. Um, obviously, we'll also be using Fedora, but that will be for or later. And one of the key changes here we're making is that we're working, we're going to work with a vendor and it'll be vendor supported. So um, there's a diagram to the right, if you can view it kind of, which shows more of our full repository infrastructure for preservation and where we, um, where we intend to go. Um, I'm gonna let Mark take over and kind of talk about our interim solution here um, for this project. Yeah, so as Emily said, we used Island Door 7 for a really long time with Fedora 3.8 and um, we, uh, are still actively in our search for our new system. We're working and we're hoping to resolve that soon, but we had this upcoming deadline of November, 2021 uh, to go live with something. So we've come up with this idea of developing a stopgap platform that I just wanna really talk about briefly um, that is mostly in React, um, but interacts with our current Fedora instance until we can get everything into our new platform. Um, so why not just use our current uh, stack in it, uh, as is? Um, as far as we know, uh, Islandor 7 doesn't really have a, a, a triple IF presentation um, uh, API support, and it certainly doesn't have that for presentation v3. Um, uh, and we also really wanted to have something that looked really good and was lightweight and easy to create in a really short period of time. And so we came up with this concept of just kind of building a React-ish app, which was, is um, going to use Mirador 3 for uh, a viewer, Lunar for search and browse, um, Fedora for storing our um, materials, and uh, something we call Triple IIIF Assemble, a little piece of middleware for generating out our Prez V3 manifest. Um, so what goes into Fedora for us? Everything. That includes the access proxy. Um, on ingest, we generate out um, uh, automatically uh, technical metadata about the proxy that we store in our Rails int RDF, which is really um, a little file that we use for um, uh, triples about um, data streams that make up an object and not the entire object. Um, we keep our descriptive metadata and our structural metadata about our proxies in a mods file. I'll talk a little bit about that a little later. And then we have, um, in every case, at least an English transcript, and in some cases for um, Spanish language videos, English transcripts and uh, transcripts in Spanish. And so those are all kept um, in separate binaries. Um, so we thought about whether or not we should just statically generate um, or statically store these in our Fedora instance, but, uh, or sorry, our presentation V3 manifest. But we know that likely the way we do things is that we'll change our mods, we'll change something. Um, so we're generating those on the fly with a little application that we call IIIF Assemble. 
And essentially what triple F the symbol does is it's between our stopgap app and our Fedora instance and basically translates different information to presentation V3. So you can see here, um, descriptive information from the mods goes to the appropriate descriptive elements inside Pres V3. Um, similarly, structural metadata about um, the ranges go to structures and ranges and um, our proxies and transcripts are end up being web annotations inside the Pres V3 manifest. Um, I want to talk briefly about challenges that we, we've had for um, what, what we've done um, with mapping to Pres V3 and just what our solutions have been. Um, so the first thing that we did was uh, we got, when we got the data from the interview team, we had really, really good uh, metadata. Um, and some of that uh, that we got was they had gone through and curated each proxy to uh, capture um, different interview questions, uh, chapters, and um, uh, gave, passed those to us um, with like a label and a, um, a timestamp. So what we wanted to do was leverage that to do structures and ranges in Pres V3. Um, uh, but because we were generating things on the fly, we needed a way to store that. So what we've come up with is we've, uh, in mods, this is not really easy to do. So we've extended mods with the mods extension element uh, with PB core um, and stored things so that we can uh, uh, then generate our Pres V3 manifest. So here you can see we have a PB core title that represents an interview question. We have a part type annotation that says which range that, that range should belong to and then a start and end time in like a human readable format. I'm not exactly sure what this is, but our triple IF assemble app takes that, creates a, uh, uh, a range in Pres V3 with a label and a um, W3 media fragment. Um, another thing that they spent a whole lot of time on was captions and subtitles. They used Canvas Open Studio for generating these initially, but um, the word error rate was only about 80%. So they had to go back and do a lot of cleanup. And then also they did things like inter identified people who were speaking and um, did some really good things to make cap really good captions. So we wanna make sure that um, we were do using those in the project. So what we're doing here is uh, essentially just doing a web annotation. Um, the one thing worth noting here that's a little bit different than the, uh, um, the corresponding uh, recipe in the IIIF cookbook is we're using the motivation of supplementing rather than painting. Um, to us, painting, uh, uh, and if, you, if you're unfamiliar with motivations, essentially that what that is, is just like the purpose of what the web annotation does, and it, it gives instructions to the viewer of what it should do. Um, we feel that painting um, uh, tells viewers that the transcript should always be displayed, but since we have multiple and we want those things to be toggleable, we think supplementing is a more, um, more correct motivation, so we've, we've uh, mapped things that way. Um, I want to talk just a little bit about um, how, how things look in different viewers and why we settled on Mirador 3. Here you can see one of our oral histories um, uh, in Universal Viewer. It does exactly what we want with our interview questions. So you have our interview questions here on the left. If you click or interact with them, it takes you exactly where you want, we want you to in, in, um, in the viewer to that, that, that timestamp. But unfortunately, we don't get captions and subtitles. Um, similarly, with uh, Mirador 3, we get exactly what we want with captions. We can have multiple languages, they're toggleable, they show up exactly how we want, but we don't get our structures and ranges the way that we want. For that reason, what we've decided to do is to use Mirador 3 because of the importance of us having captions and subtitles in this project. And what we're going to do is we're going to leverage the uh, temporarily um, uh, the structures and ranges that we defined outside of the viewer with a separate component that will essentially do what uh, happens inside a universal viewer. And that's in, unless we're able to come up with a solution to do that with Mirador. Um, we also just briefly want to talk about delivering transcripts in a little bit different way too. We're going to also take our web BTT files and create a searchable transcript um, outside of the viewer so that you can um, search for a specific uh, string of text, find where that thing um, was said, um, click that uh, uh, anchor, and then have that portion of the video load in the viewer. Um, we're not using structures and ranges inside of Pres V3 for this. Instead, we're just leveraging the VTT file um, and its timestamp directly. 
Um, so timeline and delivery. Um, we're still working on this project. Uh, we're through the planning stages. We've done most of the uh, interviews and are, um, are finishing up our metadata and our transcripts um, and have finished mostly our assemble app that um, ties all this together. But uh, the, the bulk of the work that's left is building the front end the way that we want it. Um, you can kind of see a little mock up here of what we have, but our timeline for delivery is November, 2021. Um, and we're excited to get this out to everyone and to use IIIF Pres V3 for, to do so. Um, and I think we have a few minutes for questions. Thank you, that's great. So um, if you want to unmute yourself and ask questions or type it into the, either the Q&A or chat on Hoover and I'll, I'll read them out. Um, just on your um, mention of supplementing, uh, you made the right choice and we're actually in the process of updating the recipe uh, to change it to supplementing. So as uh, Tom Krenz says in the chat, um, supplementing was definitely the right choice. Um, so Joseph Padville is asking, uh, I'm just curious how you hope researchers might reference or cite portions of the data you were presenting. You mentioned there's lots of dynamic parts. So how, might, how might this work? So that is a good question. Um, and I think uh, that's something that we honestly haven't thought a lot about. I think at first we were thinking we would have this next generation application out, which will have um, a way for us to arc things um, for more permanence um, and uh, let people be able to um, cite things uh, uh, permanently. Um, that's something I think that we need to think about um, as it relates to this in, in in order to, to make it so that um, any, any sort of references um, uh, live on forever. Looks like there's another question about Islandora 8. Um, we did look into Islandora 8. We did a comparison of Islandora 8 um, internally um, with uh, Hyrax Haiku and made a decision. Uh, we're also looking for digital collections as well as IR replacement. We, we have a digital commons IR platform. And so we're looking to replace both of those. And we made a decision to go with the Hyrax Haiku environment um, for, both, for both of those. Um, so we did look into those. And I also see that Rob says that we should uh, think about um, citation via content state API. And that's something I think we can we, we will take back from this and, and think about and figure out how we can leverage that. So I think you can see the discussion um, about persistent identifiers and is that going to work with your uh, kind of dynamically creating the manifest? Are you going to be able to create persistent identifiers? That's a good question and something I think we need to think about and how this is going to work. Um, uh, I don't have an immediate question and I think what we should do is really think about, uh, about a couple different things content state API and also uh, arcs as they relate to um, perhaps uh, uh, manifests. That's great. Um, so we're almost at time. Uh, any other questions? No? Well, thank you both. Uh, that was a really, really interesting presentation. Uh, so I'll end the session now. The next session is this uh, extra keynote, uh, which is starting right now. So if you want to jump over to Hoover onto the other uh, Zoom channel. So thank you all.